So the big exciting thing that uh, we're working on right now is the giant Magellan telescope. And this uh, telescope is going to, is really going to change the way we do business. It's a um, amazing step forward from what we have right now. So it's 25 meters across. That's 83 uh, feet across. And I, I guess I, I was, I mistyped that. That's 83 feet in diameter, not square feet. And it's uh, 368 square meters. And that's 4,000 square feet of surface area on this primary mirror. It's a very large house. And this is being made here at uh, the Richard F. Karras Beer Lab at U of A out of seven eight meter segments. So 8.4 meter segments. Each one of those is uh, 27.6 feet across. And you can see them there in this uh, beautiful movie. This is, a, of course, a, an engineering rendering of the design of the dome and telescope. So you can see these uh, seven segments that make up this uh, 25 meter or 83 foot uh, primary mirror working together. Uh, this is going to be at uh, the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. Uh, this is a, another rendering of, uh, of the telescope on its uh, home. And the, the, the peak where you see the GMT is actually called uh, uh, the Las Campanas Peak. And in the distance, you can also see another peak that has two telescopes on it. That's called uh, Cerro Manke, uh, the Manke Peak. And that's where the existing uh, Magellan uh, clay and Bada telescopes are. These are, I'm going to talk a lot about those in a little bit. Uh, those are uh, telescopes that already exist. And so this rendering is, uh, even though it's just a, a, a computer drawing, it's actually very faithful to how the, the observatory really looks today. So to give you an idea of why this new telescope is going to be so powerful and why we are so interested in having the GMT, I'm here comparing a telescope you may have heard of called the Hubble Space Telescope over there on the left, which is a 2.4 meter diameter telescope. So that's about eight feet across. And then in the middle there, I have the Clay Telescope, uh, which is this existing telescope that's already in Chile at Las Campanas Observatory. And it's 6.5 meters or 21 feet across. And then on the right, I'm showing you a schematic of the primary mirror of the GMT and it's uh, 25 meters or 83 feet across. And so these white circles that I've drawn are all to scale. So I'm showing you what the, the relative sizes of these telescopes really is, or really is going to be once they're built. And so you can see that the, uh, the GMT is a, is a huge increase in size. It's actually 10 times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope in diameter. And it's four times bigger than the, the clay telescope, which we use right now down at, at Magellan. So the big benefits that we get out of this are number one, this, this light collecting area. So we are collecting more light for every second that we spend pointed at the sky. This lets us see fainter objects. The other major benefit we get out of this is the resolution. And we're gonna, I'm gonna define that term uh, in detail in a second. But what that means is that we can see finer details on the sky. So we can see, uh, smaller things, and we can see things that are closer together. So what I'm showing you here are, uh, these are, you could call them simulations or calculations. So th these are just me doing some math to, to show you what the images of a star through one of these telescopes would look like. So this is just, think of this as just a single isolate, isolated star that I've pointed each of these telescopes at. And so on the left is this 21 foot uh, Magellan clay telescope. And on the right is the 83 feet across uh, GMT. And uh, so the, the images of the stars that you see there, if you look on the left and then you see the central core and then you see it surrounded by a, a ring. I'm hoping that you can see my cursor as I'm drawing around it. You see this ring. And we call that the airy ring, A-I-R-Y. Um, and over here, you see uh, this broken up pattern around it, which is the same thing as the airy ring, but it's caused by the differences in the shape of the primary mirror because of the segments. So it's just the details of the way that a telescope made out of segments fo uh, focuses the light. 
And on the top of these, I'm gonna show you a bunch of images like this. So I just wanna make sure it's really clear what you're looking at here. So on the top of these images of a star, I have this um, line of red that going up and down. And what I want you to see what I've drawn here is this red line going across the star is showing you the path that, that the graph on the top is taking. And when the graph on the top goes up, it means that the star is getting brighter in that spot. And when it goes down, it's getting fainter. And so just looking at these images with that in mind, you can see that already, you can see a, a pretty major difference between the, the, the GMT and the clay telescope is that that red line gets a lot higher and it's a lot narrower. So right away that tells you that the GMT is, is concentrating more lights, it's collecting more lights and it's making it into a, a narrower, finer image. And so we're really interested in this because what I just said, the fact that it's collecting more light, it's concentrating it into a, a smaller area, lets us see fainter things and it lets us see things faster because we're collecting more light. And so to illustrate this, I've taken that same image of a star and I've covered it with noise. And this is just, uh, you know, for illustration purposes. So, you know, this isn't necessarily uh, any specific noise source, but this is life as an astronomer. You're always battling the noise. Uh, light itself is actually very noisy. Uh, the sky is noisy. Uh, and, uh, the telescope is noisy. Everything, everything adds extra light to your images. And uh, this causes uh, us to have to work really hard to see faint objects. And so this is kind of a representative example of what it, it, it is it, um, to look at a star through a, a field of noise. So this is a, for an arbitrary set of parameters, this is a 30 second exposure on the, on the smaller 21 foot Magellan telescope. So what we would do normally on a telescope like that is, if, you know, if, if we're looking at an image like that, we would say, that's not good enough. We need better if we're gonna to try to do actual science with it. So we would then open our shutter and we would integrate for 10 minutes and we'd get a better, uh, better image because as we go, we're beating down the noise, gathering more light and slowly making our image better. And then you might go for an hour. That's kind of the typical, uh, when we're looking at exoplanets, that's sort of a typical exposure time. We might go for two hours or four hours. But so, you, you know, we've made this image a lot better. And I'll just step back up to show you where we started. So in 30 seconds, 10 minutes, in an hour, we've made that signal stronger. The picture of the star is now basically well above the noise. And uh, it looks pretty nice. We'd be really happy if we got an image like this. But this took us an hour on the clay telescope. On the GMT, we would do that in 30 seconds. We would get an image that was just as good. Had, we call it the signal to noise ratio. That's a metric for basically statistical significance is probably the closest, closest thing you, you hear about on a, a regular basis. This is how much more powerful the GMT is than our existing telescopes. What would take us an hour to do on the six and a half meter will take us 30 seconds to do on the giant Magellan telescope. This is, just think about anything in your life that takes an hour that you don't like doing, and then imagine that you could just do it in 30 seconds. It's, it's uh, totally game-changing to be able to do this. The other major benefit of the GMT because of its size is what we call the spatial resolution. And so this, we often hear about resolution as a marketing term for cell phone cameras and things like that, where people are just talking about the number of pixels on their camera. In physics and astronomy and optics, we have a, a slightly different definition for resolution. And it basically is just, if you have two things close together, how close can they be before you can't tell them apart anymore? And I'm gonna illustrate that for you here. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a picture of, a simulated picture again of, uh, two stars very close together on the sky. So we would call this a binary star. And it, uh, most stars, in fact, are in binary pairs like this. And so this is an image of a star very close together. Here I'm using the, the 21 foot uh, clay telescope. And then what I'm gonna do is step through a sequence of images and in each image, imagine that we're moving the telescope to a different binary star. So I'm just gonna go from one, one one pair of stars to another pair of stars. 
And each time I do that, I select a pair of stars that's slightly closer together. So there's, there's a new set of stars slightly closer together. I'll keep going, it's starting to get closer. You can kind of see the images starting to combine here. So the light's starting to land on top of each other. And again, all I'm doing here is imagine that I'm just moving the telescope around, pointing it at different stars. And each, each time I pick a pair of stars, they're closer together. And so the stars start to overlap. And so now they're getting really close together. And so uh, you might start to get worried about how close they really can get. So the, what we call the resolution limit is when they get to this point. And it's, this is sort of what we think of as the last moment that, those, that it's clear that there are two stars there. And so this is what we call the resolution limit. If I go to the one more pair of stars that's slightly closer, now they've really started to blend and we say that these two stars are not resolved. I mean, you can look at that and you, you'd say, well, yes, there are two, there's probably two stars there. But, but uh, in truth, when we see an image like this, the first thing we suspect is that our instrument isn't working very well. Um, and so, you know, this is just where we stop, stop believing that we're actually seeing two stars. So now we're gonna do the same experiment, but at this time, we're also gonna use the GMT. So we, we're gonna have two telescopes working. We're gonna point them at each at the same pair of stars. And this pair of stars is gonna keep getting closer together as we select, uh, select different stars. So I'm just gonna do the same thing where I, I, I go to different stars that are getting close together. And now I think you can really start to see the difference in the giant Magellan telescope images. They're smaller. They look farther apart because the, the, the light has been concentrated so much more, even though physically in terms of the actual uh, uh, separation of the stars in real life, they are the same distance apart, but the, the GMT has made them look further apart. And I keep walking them in. And now I found a pair of stars that's at the resolution limit of the, of the Magellan clay but it's nowhere near being resolved, uh, being unresolved on the GMT. We still have plenty of separation. If you look at those two red peaks, they're very clearly defined. We're having no trouble seeing these stars and we can just keep on going. So now I've reached what we call the resolution limit of the GMT and the star on the clay telescope just looks like a regular star, a single star now. So we've been able to actually go to a binary star that was four times closer on the GMT than we were able to on the, on the Magellan Clay Telescope. So these two advantages, the fact that the, the GMT collects so much more light and it concentrates it and makes such a finer, sharper image are the two big reasons why the GMT is going to be so powerful and why it's going, going to make imaging exoplanets uh, go so much better. And so in 30 seconds, we can take images that would take us an hour on Magellan Clay. And when we do that, our images are, have four times better resolution. However, I've essentially been lying to you this whole time. So the problem is, even though the GMT is going to be so powerful, everything I just showed you, those, those, the predictions for GMT images and how sharp they're gonna look and how well this, this telescope is gonna work. I assumed perfect images. I assumed what we call a flat wavefront. So the, the light from the star comes in and it essentially travels straight to the telescope. Nothing gets in its way. The telescope works perfectly. And we get these sharp, what we call diffraction limited images. But we have this major problem on a ground-based telescope and that's atmospheric turbulence. And I suspect everyone listening right now has heard the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Uh, and that song actually kind of drives me crazy because it's a disaster for what we try to do uh, here at Stewart Observatory. And the issue is atmospheric turbulence. And so uh, atmospheric turbulence is this phenomenon that I think most people, if you've ever been on an airplane, you're familiar with this. This is caused by the mixing of hot and cold air and the wind blowing over the observatory. And this is the, uh, the phenomenon that causes uh, the stars to twinkle. So whenever you go outside at night and you see these twinkling stars like are illustrated in this, 
animation, that's turbulence. That's the, the hot and cold air as the sun heats up the Earth's surface and then the sun goes down and then the, the Earth's surface is radiating and it's heating up the, uh, the air and then the wind is blowing and it's moving over mountaintops and uh, being rolled over and over and over again, it makes the stars twinkle. And so this is a tremendous problem for what we try to do uh, uh, with ground-based telescopes. And if, if we're stuck with this, nothing I just told you is true. The GMT is not that much faster in terms of exposure time, and it does not achieve that resolution benefit that, I, um, that uh, let us see those stars that are so close together. Like I said before, this is just the same thing that you feel when you're, when you're on an airplane and you are experiencing a bumpy ride. So the way we deal with this is a, a, a technique called adaptive optics. And on the left here is a schematic of a, a, an adaptive optics or AO system. And you can see there that the light comes in uh, from the telescope into this instrument we call an AO system. And it's been distorted. On the ground, those distortions are almost uh, uh, entirely due to the uh, Earth's atmosphere and turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. And so what we do is we have a device called a wavefront sensor, which is, let's see if I can get my cursor back up there, down here, that measures the, uh, the incoming light and from that infers what the turbulence is that's blowing over the telescope. We send it into a giant computer, do a bunch of calculations, and then send a command to something called a deformable mirror. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a thin piece of glass with some uh, uh, a metallic coating on it that we can bend, and we bend it at uh, a thousand to three thousand times a second to take the shape that is exactly needed to counteract that distortion coming in from the Earth's atmosphere. And so then the light travels off this mirror, and now it's been nicely corrected. And we have this uh, beam splitter, which is just a, an, a flat piece of glass that is specially coated so that some light is transmitted and some light is reflected. And the transmitted light goes into a camera that is our science camera. So this is where we actually take the pictures of the exoplanets. And then the reflected light goes back into the wavefront sensor. And this loop that, I'm, that you see here, uh, sense the wavefront, which means sense the turbulence, do, a, do the calculations of what the control signal needs to be, send it to the deformable mirror. This is all happening in our instrument a uh, 1,000 to up to 3,600 times a second. So this is how we correct the turbulence uh, and detwinkle the stars. And this is the technology we need to have deployed on the GMT so that we can actually achieve those performance uh, gains that I was telling you about. So here's a, a, a cartoon animation of an AO system to try to help um, show exactly what's going on here. Uh, this is actually an animation done for the Gemini telescopes. Uh, there's one of these in, the, in, on, in Hawaii and another one in Chile. And so what you're gonna see here is the light comes into the telescope and it hits the primary mirror, bounces up to the secondary mirror, down through the hole in the primary and it goes into the AO system. So there's the beam splitter. The red light goes into the wavefront sensor. Sorry, the red light is going to the science camera. The blue light is going to the wavefront sensor. And so you have these wavefronts coming in and they look all crinkly, kind of like potato chips. And that's because they've been totally corrupted by the twinkling atmosphere. And so what's happened here is we've uh, we've turned on our wavefront sensor and done what we call closing the loop, where we've started sending that signal back to, to the uh, deformable mirror. We'll let the, the video play again. So it's this process of closing the loop where we have the wavefront sensor measuring the turbulence, and we have a computer calculating exactly what the turbulence is doing, uh, perhaps making a prediction about what the turbulence is going to do next. And then we close the loop and send that command to this deformable mirror, which lets us correct the uh, atmospheric turbulence in real time.
So you see that switch over there on the right that's going to close here. And so that's that signal going, uh, being sent uh, up to the deformable mirror. So that's how the, the, the basics of how an adaptive optic system works. So returning back to this uh, observatory in Chile where we uh, used to spend lots of our, lots of time. Uh, so you see the future home of the GMT. And in the background there, there's the uh, Magellan clay and Bada telescopes. Those actually exist uh, and there you can, uh, apply for time if you're an astronomer at the U of A and go down there and use those telescopes. Um, and they're both six and a half meter or 21 foot uh, across mirrors that were made here at the University of Arizona. And so what we do is we take an instrument down there that's called MAGAOX and that stands for the Magellan Adaptive Optics Extreme System. And we put it on the clay telescope. And so we put it on what's called the Naismith platform which sits on the side of the telescope there. And uh, you can see a blow up there that shows the instrument on the platform. And then if we were to just remove the covers on the instrument, that's what it would look like. And this, uh, this big gray box back here is the electronics that controls the instrument. So that it controls, that contains two giant computers and all of the uh, various drivers and current sources and voltages and everything that needs, that we need to move all of the moving the stages and the moving parts and record all the signals that come from the, the instrument. And this is a, a zoomed in view of the, of the instruments. So this is what we're gonna give you a tour of here in a few minutes. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, um, get a close up view, which hopefully uh, looks pretty good on our um, cell phone camera when we walk through there. But just to give you an idea of what you're gonna see in there, the, the red tube, that, the red beam that you see is the incoming light uh, from the telescope. And right here is our deformable mirror. This is a uh, 2000 actuator, uh, tiny, it's only about an inch across uh, deformable mirror. Uh, I saw a question go by in the chat that um, was asked if the, def the deformable mirror that we use is the, uh, the main mirror of the telescope. And this answers that question, no, it's not. So if we go back up a step, the, the primary mirror, which is the 21 feet across is here. And there's the secondary mirror and then there's actually not shown as a tertiary mirror. So our deformable mirror is way over here. And in our system, it's something like the 10th mirror that the light actually hits. So it's not, we don't actuate the, for these purposes, we don't actuate the primary mirror. Um, after, it, uh, after it moves, bounces off the primary mirror, it goes through a few more reflections and down onto the lower level. So this is where that beam splitter is. If you remember from the movie, there was this, the spot where the red light and the blue light splits off. Uh, in our system, we're showing the green light um, being split off and it's going uh, into the wavefront sensor, which is over here. And then the rest of the light goes over here into the science cameras. So we've actually taken this instrument to the telescope once. Uh, it's designed to be shifted back and forth so that we can keep working on it, uh, keep perfecting it. Um, one of the main goals that we have for this is, to, is so that we can learn from it because we want to have the technology that's in this, in this system be ready to go on the giant Magellan telescope in about 10 years. So as soon as the GMT is ready for us, we're, we want this technology to be ready to go so that we can go down to the GMT and point at a, a star and hopefully image some exoplanets. So it's already been down to Chile once and it's back in the lab. Uh, we've actually been stuck here for we're about to lose our third run because of the pandemic. So it'll be over a year and a half that we'll be sort of trapped in the lab. Uh, but because we brought it back, we haven't lost much time. We've, uh, our group has been pretty busy uh, learning how to operate it and everything. So what I'm gonna show you next here is a video that we took. So this was uh, basically a year ago. This was in December of 2019. Uh, this is during what we call our first light run. Uh, so this is when the first time we took the instrument down to the telescope and unpacked it and mounted it on the Naismith platform and turned it on. 
And so this is, instead of being an animation, this is the actual system in action. And we're gonna show it to you uh, a live version of this in a little bit, but just to um, give you an idea of what's going on. So if you can see my cursor and there's these four circles on one camera here, that's the wavefront sensor. So that's where we're actually measuring the turbulence and you can see how they're, um, how the starlight is rippling across those. That's the, that's the, uh, the signal of the turbulence. And uh, this is me holding up a, uh, a handheld cell phone camera. So it's, it moves around a little bit because uh, to be honest, I was really excited when this was happening. Um, up here you see, we actually have three deformable mirrors in our system. I only really told you about two, but you can see the signals on the DMs uh, going by as they correct the turbulence. And what you're seeing here is that we're stopping and starting the loop. So we're turning it off and turning it on so that we can prove to ourselves that it's working. And then down here, you see the two science cameras that are, lost my cursor, there, there it is. The two science cameras that are recording this corrected image as we, as we clean up the turbulence. And when, when we turn the loop off, you see it just explode into this uh, ha uh, uncorrected halo. And then when we turn it back on, all that light gets concentrated. The, it turns into a triangle because there's so much light that we're actually saturating our cameras. And then the really interesting thing that happens when we do that is that little companion pops out. So remember those images of the binary stars I showed you? This is actually a binary. It's not, uh, uh, this is a, a fainter companion. But this really gives you an idea of what's going on when we're trying to image extrasolar planets and why we need AO on a large telescope. Is when the AO system is off, you see that starlight just washing out over the, the camera. And any telescope that's not using AO, uh, that's what it looks like all the time. And this turbulence causes this problem that without AO, all telescopes basically have the same resolution. But when we turn it on, that little companion pops out. You can see that airy ring that, around the companion that tells us that we're taking a really good image. And so this is AO working on sky. And this is Mag AOX. Um, I've been seeing some good questions go by in chat. So here, uh, real quick, there was one that was uh, relevant to this. So uh, the question was, uh, is most of the AO has uses laser guide stars, does Mag AOX use lasers? So no, we don't use lasers. We actually use what we call natural guide stars. So uh, the, the question is referring to, uh, you can use a, a laser that you shine up into the atmosphere to make a spot that is your reference star. So for the standards of what we're doing, like for instance, the star that you're looking at in this movie, that laser spot is actually really faint. It's uh, maybe an eighth magnitude or 10th magnitude star. And it also is, uh, tends to be very broad. So it doesn't look like a star. Uh, so the laser is really great if you don't have a star that you can use, but the correction that you get from it isn't as good as if you can use an actual star. And it just so happens that when we're, when we're imaging exoplanets, we're always looking at bright stars. They are relatively close. Uh, because if they're too far away, then we can't resolve the planet. Uh, if you remember what the description of resolution is. So we actually always use natural guide stars with Mag AOX. It's not designed to use a laser at all. Um, and for uh, just about every exoplanet image that you've seen taken from a ground-based telescope has not used lasers. Let me see if there are any other questions. I think I saw one about Starlink. Um, so Starlink, uh, you know, is this constellation of uh, internet uh, providing satellites. So Starlink is going to be a problem for the GMT for so other science cases. Um, I haven't actually looked into quantifying that, so I can't tell you um, how much how much that's going to be a problem. Um, for my science case, it will have almost no effect. Uh, so the uh, when you're looking at these images on this movie that's going by, they are probably about two arc seconds across. And uh, the analogy I like to use for an arc second is if, if you right now just imagine plucking a hair from the top of your head and hold that hair out at arm's length and squint at it, for the, the statistically average human, that's about one arc second across. So these images I'm showing you here are, you know, one to two human hairs across if you held your human hair, your hair out at arm's length. 
So the point is, you know, Starlink is not going to be a major issue for us just because of that. The odds of it, a satellite of uh, a satellite passing through such a small field of view are very low. But that does you shouldn't take that to mean that it's not a problem for the GMT. All the people that want to use the GMT for wide field science, where they want to go really, really deep, they're going to have these trails of the Starlink satellites going through their field. Um, there's another question. That, this is a good one about the beam splitter uh, reducing light. So sometimes we use beam splitters where it's just a 50-50 cut. So half the light goes and half the light uh, gets reflected. Uh, but we also have special beam splitters that cut in wavelength. So if you remember that spectrum and there's red light and blue light, well, we have beam splitters that can send just the red light to the science camera and just the blue light to the wavefront sensor so that we don't lose any light to that process. Um, as with everything, there are pros and cons and some trades. Um, there's another question here. Uh, why don't we use the secondary mirror as the deformable mirror like the LBT? That's a great question. Um, so the Magellan AO actually, the original Magellan AO system actually had an adaptive secondary. That's what I did my PhD dissertation on. Um, and we, it's still down there. And adaptive secondaries are extremely powerful things. Uh, however, there, it's difficult to get the same number of actuators that we put in this system. So the, the LBT adaptive secondaries. Um, and so an adaptive secondary is a deformable mirror that you actually put in the secondary mirror of the telescope. And it's about a meter across, it's an optic about a meter across three feet. Um, it's difficult to put more than a few hundred. We can get up to maybe a thousand actuators. Um, and the, uh, uh, so the, the cost benefit analysis is with the, by using this small deformable mirror, that's basically a printed circuit. It's like a, a made out of silicon. We can put way, uh, many more actuators, uh, 2000 actuators across. Um, and this uh, really lets us uh, get to high actuator density. Uh, the MEMS that we're, we use is also faster. So the adaptive secondary, because it's so big, is it, somewhat limited. Um, so I'm not gonna go into adaptive secondaries very much more, but I'll just say that the reason you use them is primarily because they have better noise performance in the thermal infrared. So when everything's warm, you wanna put your DM uh, on the adaptive secondary. Um, I think I saw one more question before I go to this, this slide and we go to the tour. Um, how close to the diffraction limit of the GMT do we expect to get? Um, so with the, so that's a good lead into this slide. So, uh, so MagioX, which I'm dying to give you a tour of here. So I'm gonna, we're gonna get to this here in a second. Um, this is, uh, its primary goal is to do science. And so we offer it to astronomers every semester uh, and someday we'll be able to go back and do some more observing and do science with it. But it's also a, a test bed, it's also an experiment. And we think of it as laying the groundwork to go find life with the GMT. This is where we're learning what the algorithms, we're learning how to build the technology, we're building how to integrate it all, we're learning how to make it work at the telescope. Um, and we have a plan, which because of time, I'm not going into in any detail, but we have the, we already are working on the next version, which we of course called GMAG AOX for the giant Magellan AO extreme system, which instead of 2000 actuators, we'll need 21,000 actuators. And uh, to quantify how close to the diffraction limit we'll get, um, I will say that essentially that system should get us to the diffraction limit. Um, the, if using image quality metrics, we'll, we should get to something like 80% of the diffraction limit, which is um, without defining that very well, that's uh, essentially about as best as you can do once you take into account all of the instruments all, all of the optics and the instruments and everything. Um, and so I think with that, we'll switch to giving the tour here. And uh, just keep the questions coming in chat and uh, I will um, address them as we go here. So, uh, behind me here is MagioX in our clean room. And I'm gonna switch my camera around. Uh, Tom, can you give me a verbal thumbs up that that looks okay and you can, you can see my screen? 
Yes, I can see your screen. Uh, I mean, you can see the camera? I can see the camera, yes. Okay, so so you are looking into our clean room right now, which is where uh, we're, we keep MagAOX uh, while we're off the telescope. And I'm gonna uh, head back over here where we are uh, uh, ready to give you a demo. And I'll, I'll introduce you to my, uh, my lab assistants who I forced to, to stay up late and come into the lab. So uh, right now in the driver's chair is uh, Dr. Sebastian Hafford. He's a NASA Sagan fellow working with us. Behind him is uh, Alex Hedlin, who's a PhD student working with Professor Laird Close. Uh, he's done a lot of the uh, mechanics and uh, optics in MagUX. And behind me over here, is Lauren Schatz, who's a PhD student in optics who uh, designed our wavefront sensor. And she's been doing a lot of uh, research on uh, uh, AO and wavefront sensing here. So Sebastian's getting the system all set up. You wanna share the screen? So he's gonna share the control screen for MagAOX here. It's great. So, um, so what you're looking at here right now is if you, you probably recognize this uh, jumble of, uh, of uh, images from the movie that I just had looping for a while. And uh, but here, instead of being pointed at an actual star, we're we're running simulated turbulence in the lab. So we're just using our deformable mirrors to to fake it. Uh, but this is how we do a lot of testing and. Uh, and break in our system so that we can understand what's going on. And when we get to the telescope, we know it's gonna work. So what you're seeing here in uh, the, this, uh, the big four images are that wavefront sensor and you're seeing the, the signal of the turbulence going across. And you see in this, uh, on the right side, you see this uh, yellow box. And that's the image of a star that is being corrupted by turbulence and we're not doing anything to control it. So this is uh, what you would see if you just look through an eyepiece without AO on a six and a half meter telescope. And so now Sebastian's gonna turn the loop on and there, boom, it just cleans up the star, makes the turbulence go away. You can see how much it changed on the wavefront sensor. And then we got this nice image of the star. Um, hey, Alex, would you go into the clean room and just push on the table? So uh, Alex is gonna go into the clean room and he's actually basically gonna pound on the instrument and make it dance. That should work. So you can see that, that's good. Don't break it. Uh, so that's just to prove to you guys that we're not faking this. This isn't a simulation. We actually have light running through optics and we're uh, actually controlling things. Jared, um, what are you using as your test source, your fake star? Um, it's just a very bright laser. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's called a super continuum laser. So it's like, a, it's basically a white light, but it's made with a lasing process and uh, it's super bright. Uh, you know, actually you can start fires. Uh, and uh, by the time it actually gets to our science cameras, it's pretty faint because we had to do a lot of work to make it into a good quality beam. Uh, but that's, that's all it is. It's just a, uh, we have what we call a telescope simulator. Uh, that is in the instrument that uh, we can uh, use a just a moving mirror that we can put in the simulator when we want to do tests like this. And when we take the mirror out, uh, when we're actually ready to look at a star. So you could turn the loop off again and then back on a couple times so people can really see that happen. And I think. Yeah, so there you can just see it turn on and you can see that, uh, um, I guess it's hard to steal this. So is my cursor on this, this is the control okay. channel for the deformable mirror. So when he turns it on and off, that's where you can see the signals come stop and stop, uh, start. Okay, and how fast could you put in a chronograph? Probably with the, yeah. 
So what uh, Sebastian's gonna do now is uh, put in a device we call a coronagraph. And so something I didn't talk about when I was showing you my slides is that is the, the sort of final problem we have to deal with. And that's that stars are really bright and planets are really faint. So we have to have a way to get rid of the starlight. And so uh, what Sebastian has been working on is uh, uh, basically a, a special optic that goes in and blocks the light. And then Sebastian's actually been working on then applying special commands to the DM to make that work even better. Oh, that worked really well. <laughs> it's gone. Okay, uh, that's the that's life with uh, trying to do live demos. So okay, so why don't we turn the loop off? Stop turbulence and zero. Oh, there you can kind of see it there. So what we've done here is block the starlight, uh, and so that hopefully a faint planet could then come out in the noise. Okay, so why don't we uh, turn the loop off? I'm going to answer some questions while Alex and Lauren get the panels off. Actually, Jared, could you also use your iPhone to show the test bed again? Because it took me a while to figure out how to isolate that view for everyone. Uh, well, yeah, so what, what's going to happen is, you mean the instrument itself? Yeah, when you first you stop sharing. went back there, yeah, when you first went back there, um, a lot of people probably saw it as a small thumbnail, and I figured out how to sh make it big for everyone, so. Okay, so um, is it big now? Yes, it is. Okay, so what's going on here is we started out here, and these guys are, uh, they're, they're currently opening the instrument up so that we can take a good look at it inside. Sure. And then just to give everyone sort of a orienting view. So here's the electronics rack for the instruments. And over here is where Sebastian was working. And just to give you an idea of the, the Megalox command center. So going, while well, these guys are getting the panels off, uh, a couple more questions. Sure. Um, when splitting the light to a specific wavelength, does the correction apply equally across the spectrum? That is a really good question. And the answer is no, it does not. It's actually one of the, the uh, hardest problems is that when, if we're correcting in, the, in blue light, let's say you know, at 500 nanometers, which well, that, we call it blue, it would look green to you. Um, then, and we, we switch to the infrared to do our science, the correction is different. It's not dramatically different. Uh, it's close, but uh, for exoplanets, the problem is that close isn't really good enough. So this is actually a, a, a big area of research in our field is how do you deal with the fact that, and the, the, the technical word for this is that the index of refraction of air varies with wavelength. Uh, and this is the reason there are rainbows, uh, is one way to think about it is that as light goes through different materials and different wavelengths, we, we respond to uh, uh, respond to their interactions with those materials differently, and this happens in air. Um, so that's that's a great question, and it's uh, uh, a very hard question actually to to deal with. Uh, curious about the computers needed to accomplish the AO control generic or special. Um, they're usually very special. Uh, on MagOX, we're using uh, off-the-shelf components, but it, they're actually very powerful uh, uh, multiprocessor servers with uh, lots of GPUs um, because we need uh, quite a bit of, of processing power. And the reason we're off-the-shelf is that means it's upgradable and maintainable, but a lot of AO systems actually use uh, custom computers. Will the DM for GMagOX be 10 times bigger? Uh, it'll actually be uh, 100 times bigger. Sorry, yes, it'll be 10 times bigger. So we're going from, uh, from 2,000 actuators to 21,000 actuators. Um, and we're actually, it's a, uh, a trick we're playing that uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Laird Close and uh, Alex Hedlund have been working together on uh, by using seven of the mirrors that we're currently using in MagOX. Uh, slightly bigger, 3,000 instead of 2,000 actuators and matching one to each segment, then we can essentially uh, build a DM that's big enough for the GMT out of existing technology. 
So it'll, it'll technically be 10 times bigger, but without actually having to build a 10 times bigger fungal mirror. So let's go into the clean room and just give you a close up look at uh, Maggie X. So this is something that we would never do on a regular public evening lecture is let uh, a bunch of people come into our clean room. And uh, you want to come in and point at stuff? Sorry about the bumpy ride there. So uh, this is the inside of Maggie X. Lauren's going to hold my camera for a second. You can start at the top there. So Alex is pointing back there at where the deformable mirror is. And you see all the white cables running from it. So there's basically has to be 2000 wires running through our 2000 actuators. Uh, there was a question about our light source. You just pointed it at the top there. Yeah, so that's our big, big super continuum laser that uh, powers the, um, the optics. And so it's always kind of hard to, to follow the light path through. Um, but if you saw, if you remember from the graphic I showed you, then it comes down here to this bottom level. And you can just, probably the only thing that uh, you really should take away from this is how complicated it, an instrument has to be to image extrasolar planets. Uh, we all kind of get lost when we're talking about it and trying to figure out what's not working, what's wrong when we're doing an experiment because there are so many moving parts and so many little details and motors that all have to be in the right place to uh, micron precision in many cases. Um, and so making this all work is, has been quite a challenge. It's taken us, uh, basically took us three and a half years to get it all together and get it to the telescope. And the project's not done. We have a ton of work left to do uh, to make it all really go. Um, well, okay, so um, that's all I have uh, prepared here, um, but I'd be happy to keep taking more questions in chat. Yes, or, uh, you can either uh, type a question into the chat if you have one, or if you'd prefer to ask it yourself, just raise your hand and uh, I can call on you. We can open your mic and you can ask the question verbally. Uh, Tom, I'm going to go back to sharing my uh, presentation here real quick. Okay, go ahead. By the way, I'm looking at the chat. Hello, Mr. Schwain. Yes, I do know your son, Everett. Uh, he is one of our valuable astronomers here at Stewart Observatory. His office is actually just across the hall from our lab. So back, in, back when we used to uh, actually come to work on a regular basis, uh, we saw him a lot. So thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, am I sharing that screen? I'm not sharing that screen. No, you're not. Uh, but while I'm working on this, please go ahead with more questions if you got. Okay. I don't see anyone with their hand up. Okay. So I just wanted to show one more slide here if I can. Okay. Oh, Zoom crashed on my computer. Uh, so the slide I'm trying to show you is just uh, showing you the, the rest of our fantastic team of uh, astronomers and optical engineers here that uh, work on MAGEOX. Well, while you're doing that, we do have some more questions in the chat. Okay. For example, are there international collaborators on, in this project? Uh, yes, very much so. So uh, speaking just for MAGEOX, um, in particular, we have a very close collaboration with uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, that's actually where uh, Dr. Sebastian Hafford got his PhD. That's uh, where he comes to us from. Um, and uh, on the GMT itself, this is a very international project. Uh, so there's a, a very large consortium of, of uh, institutions from our, around the world, uh, including uh, South Korea and Australia and Brazil, um, all working together on the GMT. Okay. 
Someone's uh, asking about what the term MEMS, M-E-M-S. Oh, sorry, I threw that out there without defining it. Yes. Uh, yeah, MEMS, M-E-M-S stands for Microelectrical Mechanical System. And uh, so what it is, uh, if, you have a, if you have a modern cell phone that uh, knows which way it's up and which way it's pointing, it has a MEMS accelerometer in it, just to put this in context to how common these devices are. Um, and uh, what they are is that is they're basically uh, little pieces of silicon that have been uh, designed to do some specific task, uh, like be an accelerometer. In our case, they've had all of this special etching and wires attached to it so that we can send voltages to it and it pushes and pulls on the, on the surface of silicon that is then uh, uh, coated with gold in our case, or maybe some other uh, material. Okay. So the, the screen I put up is just uh, our current team. This is just pulled from our, our uh, website today. Um, it's not, in, uh, I don't have pictures of all of our alumni and a, a bunch of other uh, collaborators here at the Stewart Observatory. And I uh, should acknowledge Professor Laird Close is the, he's uh, done a lot of the work on MagioX, including the optical design. Um, and he and I work basically hand in hand on MagioX and GMagioX. And uh, Professor Guillaume uh, wrote a lot of the real-time software that we're looking at. Uh, you met uh, Sebastian, Lauren, and Alex just now. And then Kyle, Jen, Joseph, Alex, Maggie, and Logan are all working hard on making MagioX uh, better and get ready for the, uh, for the GMT. Okay, Jared, there were a couple more questions here. We have a question from Vanessa. Can you just explain how the actuators work? Maybe a brief explanation? Yeah, so when we say actuator, what we just you can just think of it as a stick glued to the back of a mirror. And then there's some kind of motor on the stick that pushes and pulls on the stick, causing the glass to bend. Um, and so uh, in, uh, in the case of these, the mirrors that we're using, uh, the, the MEMS mirror that we were talking about, the stick is basically uh, electrical voltage pushing on uh, across a gap between two pieces of metal. And so you apply a voltage, it makes a force and you push and pull on. Um, we were talking about adaptive secondary mirrors before those actually are magnets that you um, change the magnetic force on and it pushes and pulls on that. Um, um, but just sort of imagine that you took your bathroom mirror and glued a bunch of sticks to the back of it and then sat there and, and pushed and pulled on the sticks to make the mirror take a specific shape. And that's basically what's going on. Okay. Now here's a question that is more of an astronomy politics question. How will the time on the GMT be divided, say between exoplanets versus other astronomy? Uh, very I don't carefully. Think we can answer that. <laughs> so, um, not, yeah, I don't think we can give an answer that is, you know, accurate to the percentage, but uh, the way it works is we, um, each of the, and, and because the GMT is a new telescope and we don't, it's not super clear exactly how all of the rules are gonna be. But so I'm just gonna answer for how the clay telescope works. So the U of A is a partner in the clay telescope and we have a certain percentage of the nights. Um, and so let's say that we were a 10% partner. Out of 365 nights, that would mean that we would get 36 nights. You get less than that because there's maintenance and things that has to happen. So on this one telescope, if you are a 10% partner, you have 10% of the nights, you get about a month a year. And then here at the U of A with um, all of our, um, our friends, once a semester, every six months, we write a proposal and we submit it to a committee of our peers and they read it and they rank all of those proposals and they decide which ones are the most interesting. But then it's not just, so that it's not just based on who's on the committee, there's, you know, there's some going around and making sure that all the areas of astronomy are represented and that some um, hot topics are dealt with, that instruments that need time for uh, what we call engineering, which is basically uh, maintenance, uh, they get their time. And so there's a, a, a very, uh, rigorous process, but it's based on competition of the science and the quality of a proposal. However, and there can be some subjectivity in it because when it comes down to, well, what's more important to look at? Search for exoplanets or find the furthest quasar? You know, that's a question that, that really is subjective. 
Um, it really is. And, uh, but that's why there's that round of, you know, are we making sure that all of the areas of science that Stuart Observatory right. does are represented in right. the outcome? Uh, here's a question from Robert that I kind of skipped over. How well are you able to image exoplanets in the habitable zone? So uh, I sort of intentionally didn't talk about the habitable zone. Okay. Uh, because, uh, it, which is fine, uh, but because that's a, uh, that's a whole nother layer of, of, uh, of difficulty, but that is our goal. And so the habitable zone was what we is loosely defined as the region around a star where water could be liquid on a planet's surface. So that means it's not so close that the, all the water boils away and it's not so far away that all the um, water freezes. And so a planet that's in the habitable zone will have liquid water. And we think that that's one of the fundamental things that we need for there to be life on a planet for there to be liquid water on the surface of the planet. So the entire goal of GMAG AOX is to be able to, to image extrasolar planets in the habitable zone. And if you want to find life, that's what we have to be able to do. MAG AOX, the instrument that we just showed you, probably isn't going, I, I should say that it's going to be the last thing we do because it's the hardest thing we can possibly do. And that's image a planet in the habitable zone. And that would be, if you've heard of Proxima Centauri and Proxima Centauri B, the planet that's in the habitable zone, that would be the planet that we could do it on. Uh, but be, with only six and a half meters of diameter, 21 feet of diameter, um, it's going to be extremely hard for us to do it with MAGAOX. But G MAGAOX, because it's going to have such better resolution, four times the resolution, that's when we're really going to be able to push into the habitable zone and do planets, characterize planets like Proxima b, and uh, probably up to 10 or 20 other planets uh, in the solar neighborhood. Okay. We have a couple more questions that have come in here at the end. What is the length of travel in the actuators? Um, so a good round number is a micron. So that's uh, one uh, millionth of a meter. Um, and uh, the reason that I just rattle that off is that uh, that's about the wavelength of light. So, you know, uh, visible light is about 500 nanometers in wavelength. And the infrared light that we often uh, use to image planets is uh, roughly around one micron. And so that's the, that sets the scale of the corrections we're trying to do. And so, um, and that's, you know, a micron, a micrometer is extremely small. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we're talking about deformable mirrors, and I'm making this analogy of sticks on your bathroom mirror, don't try it because you'll break it. You know, we're, we're only moving things by, you know, very tiny amounts when we're in reality. Okay, Jared, here's a more practical question. With close tolerances between the components in the AO, are there special transportation protocols to follow in shipping it down to Chile? Um, yes, so uh, our, our shipping system, I should have put some pictures of this in, our, in the talk, but um, our shipping system is, what is probably the, the most old, uh, carefully engineered part of the project, in truth, um, mostly because of this problem, that uh, our, we have these very expensive, very delicate optics that we're putting on a truck and an airplane and we can't afford them to break. You know, things like uh, the internal alignment of our system and things, if we sort of understand that that's gonna change in shipping. Though uh, my uh, uh, Professor Close, Larry Close has uh, done an amazing job of making our system not get misaligned very much during shipping. Uh, and so we don't actually have to worry about it very much. But um, in truth, our system actually rides on, on uh, probably the safest, most over-engineered shipping box that you've ever seen designed. Um, and then, but that said, you know, we hire a shipping company to come get it and they put it on an air ride truck and they drive it to the airport in Miami and it gets on a special freighter and uh, freighter aircraft and flies to Santiago. And then it gets on another uh, air ride truck and takes a very slow trip up the mountain. And then we uh, just have to be super careful when we're handling it. But, uh, Okay. It's, it's probably the most nervous time in the whole project is when our instrument is in the air. Jared, there's one more question that's come in. Will you be able to do spectroscopy 
of exoplanets. Yes. So um, that's really the uh, that's really how we do science. And I see that up there that does AO get aid in getting a spectrum. Um, and that and so absolutely we uh, want to do spectroscopy. Um, and you know that spectroscopy could mean you know very broad filters, uh, but it could be very very fine spectral resolution where we're looking at individual uh, lines of molecules. And um, just to clarify what spectroscopy is, that's when we take the light from a planet or from a star and spread it out into a rainbow. Um, so if you you know anytime you've seen a rainbow, you've seen a spectrum, um, and we make rainbows out of the starlight. We do it with very high precision. We do it with very fancy instruments. And then what we do is we analyze the rainbow and that's how we find out whether there's things like oxygen or water or methane or carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere of a planet. All and, right. and, and just to uh, follow up on this previous question, AO absolutely aids with that. Uh, AO makes everything better and it concentrates the light. So it means that there's more, less noise or more light over the noise, if you will. Uh, in the spectrum so we can go to higher resolution and, and do a better job of detecting molecules. All right, thank you so much, Jared, for taking the time to give this presentation. We also thank those of you who have uh, watched this public evening lecture. I will remind you that our next lecture will be on April the 5th, where uh, Dr. Kevin Wagner is gonna talk about a discovery that he's made uh, regarding exoplanets and the Alpha Centauri star system. So until April the 5th, I wish you a good night from Stewart Observatory.